I thought that I had heard that song 50 times, 100 times, but I had never heard it. I had never heard it before. This was the first time. Thank you for sharing that. It's beautiful. And I just hope all of you can come early, if you don't usually, some Sunday to hear Sean's preludes. Awesome. You got to hear that stuff. Today, of course, is Valentine's uh, Week Sunday, and so we're going to talk about love, but love is, uh, love, is, love is it. Love is the binding power of the universe. It is the magnetic force of the universe. It is that impetus of creation itself, the oneness that is God, that is divine intelligence. That oneness seeks and sought to experience itself as the beloved and then became the multiplicity of forms all of you and all of uh all the uh the trees and the forests and the eggplants and the and the elephants and the and the stars and the asteroids everything in the universe is that 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 divine seeking to create and then god is love and god is loving god loving god back <laughs> God is love and versa visa, as the sign says. God is that loving force. But, you know, sometimes I'm not sure what love is. Is it the sentiment on a card at Valentine's Day? Could be, but, you know, loving, love is not a feeling, although you feel it. Love is not a sentiment, although you can get sentimental about it. Love is a dynamic force that you can experience. It is a strength and power that shows up sometimes one way and sometimes another way. And there's no easy textbook on, oh, this is the way I've got to love in every situation. I wish there was. Actually, there kind of is. It's found here. I want you to touch your heart in a sense, but your heart will tell you to do love, to be love, to show up as love in a different way every time. And once you think you've got love all figured out, love will sneak around from the other side. I had a friend of mine who went to a unity church, grew up in a unity church, and through the Sunday school, and then she became an adult in that church. And that church was just down the road from my first church. And so uh, I knew the minister there, Gertrude Tuntlin. At this time, when I became a minister, she was in her 80s, and she was a very imposing figure. She was a figure of power and force. Well, my, my, uh, my friend shared, and I loved her. She, she uh, mentored me many times, but there was no nonsense about this person. My friend grew up downstairs in the Sunday school where Gertrude Tuntland's sister, whose name I don't remember, taught the children that love is meek and mild and yielding and warm and nurturing and, and very sweet. And so then she got old enough so that at least occasionally she'd go upstairs to the adult part where Gertrude Tuntland would talk about love as having boundaries and uh, don't be a pushover and uh, uh, create your life and dynamically uh, assert the who that you are. And that was love. And she, she said to me, I grew up confused. I didn't know whether I should believe in upstairs love or downstairs love. <laughs> How many have had that problem between upstairs love and downstairs love? And the truth is, is that there's no easy answer except for right here. Right here is where that answer comes because you, there's no formula for love. Love isn't a sentiment. Love just is. Love is that fundamental force of the universe. And so what's here? How do you get in touch with this? I didn't know anything about this. I, in 1977, my first heart experience ever happened. Everything went wrong in my world. Uh, my, uh, I was working in a hardware store where it was in a... Um, a, for, a, a community with a naval base, and there were a lot of retired naval officers who would come in because they had a lot of time on their hands, they did a lot of handiwork around, and they were used to ordering around enlisted men, and I guess because I was young and working in a hardware store, they would do that with me, and I didn't like it one bit. So I was really taking it personally. Very hard to love when you take things personally, right? And the other thing is upstairs, I had a couple of neighbors who were, it was before the Me Too era, and they were involved with some pretty tough I could hear is it was an old Victorian building and uh, there wasn't any soundproofing and they were do they were being abusive with their families and the landlord was taking their side and 
Then uh, my girlfriend was out of the country and I found out stuff was going on that was not kosher. And then my meditation teacher was, uh, went off the deep end. She just did. And I ended up having to leave that meditation group. And everything just dissolved. It all dissolved. And, you know, when everything dissolves, there's only one place to go. Who are you going to call? Not Ghostbusters. Your heart. Your heart. And, but I didn't know that. So what happened? But I did do this. In my desperation, I sat down on my bed, and I was at wit's end, and I just said, help. And I felt a warmth. A f- it wasn't a physical warmth, but it felt physical. It was tangible. I could feel it palpable in my heart. And this warmth came with some words. What I experienced was the first time I ever had a revelation. You know what a revelation is? It's when you're downloaded from, with spiritual information, spiritual something that includes within it everything you need to understand it, everything that you need from, top, from the top of your head to the tips of your toes, everything is contained within this realization. And the words were this, Behold, I give you a new heart, I take away your heart of flesh and I, a stone, and I give you a heart of flesh. That comes from 1 Samuel, but I didn't know that. I must have heard of it somewhere, but I had to look it up in a, in a concordance. And what, what happened along with it was the realization in that moment instantly that if I needed to know what to do in any of these problem areas or just in general in my life, the answer was go into your heart. Maybe touch your heart but at least feel into your heart and then ask, what should I do? Or feel into your heart and you'll know what to do. So I'd be in the hardware store and some some retired naval officer would be going off on me and I would sometimes just walk away and other times I would ignore it and sometimes I would engage him and sometimes I would turn it into a joke and it always worked. It was amazing and in all the other areas of my life it worked out one after another after another and what happened what it did by following my heart it led me into ministry into the ministerial school 20 years before i intended to do it i planned to do it when i was in my 40s but there i was and i ended up going the next year to ministerial school and i got another 20 years under my belt here what was that about that was finding out where the guidance lies The words that came to me later were, I lead with my heart and I'm open at the top. Together, I lead with my heart and I'm open at the top. Leading with your heart is touching into that good heart of you, which is your soul's, which is evidence of your soul. It's the evidence of your soul and it's a a handy shortcut to get in touch with all that abstract stuff that's all spiritual but when you just get in touch with your heart, it's like, yeah. I can, it brings it down to a level where I can understand it, where I can do something with it. And I found that in my life, it became a tool that I could use. Now, I wish I did it a lot more and remembered all the time because I still forget. But when I remember to do this one thing, I lead with my heart. I get into my heart. And it's, not, it's simple, but it's not easy, but it's simple. <laughs> so just... Trying that out was, was so powerful for me. And it worked in many instances. I was in a church once early in the morning. I got a um, call from a woman on a Sunday morning. And I was just getting ready to leave to go to the church. And she called and she said, I wouldn't bother you on a Sunday morning, but my 13-year-old daughter has been out all night. I just got a call from the police. She's been picked up on hard drugs. They say, you know, it turns out she's an addict, 13. And... Uh, I don't, you know, I don't know what to do. And I said, let's, let's just touch. I mean, I didn't have any answers for her. Uh, so I said, let's just touch into our hearts and let's just, let's just know together. And the words came all over me, tough love, tough love. I didn't know what tough love was. I, I thought there was an organization called tough love where the parents were mean to their kids. That's, that's all I knew about it, but I didn't know what it was. Well, it turns out I shared it with her, and she, she said, I'm going to look that up, and she did. Found out that it wasn't that at all. It was an organization that taught parents to be tough with themselves because they were enabling bad behavior and not exercising the proper discipline with themselves that would allow them to set boundaries with their children. And so this woman got into this tough love organization. But the next thing that happened was that they, they put the girl on probation, they gave her community service, and... Uh, 
a number of hours, and her mother said, well, she should, can she do it in the church office? Sure. But the first time she showed up, she was high. And so we had to send her home. The mother had to work with this. It was a difficult, I mean, tough love is tough because it's not being tough on someone. It's sometimes tough to be tough with yourself. But she learned how to exercise love. And the emphasis is on the love in a way that had boundaries and was healthy and not codependent, and not enabling. And that girl became an international officer in the Youth of Unity, got her PhD uh, in urban planning. And last time I heard was, the, um, was the, uh, the admissions director of a major university whose name you'd know. And uh, how that happened. Now, not everybody avails themselves of the opportunities that you give, but the, she was teachable at that age. But in that situation, she got, the mother got into her heart, and her heart led the way. I let my heart lead the way. Together, I let my heart lead the way. Now, in this situation, the mother was guided to upstairs love, tough love, um, a firm boundary-setting love. And I'm always thinking, when I think about that, I always think about Mother Teresa, because anybody who's ever dealt with Mother Teresa says that she is, mm, she was tough as nails. There was a, a story, Jerry Jampolsky, I heard him tell the story about how he flew to Calcutta because he couldn't get her to answer his letters or answer anything. So he ambushed her and he said, I need to meet with you. She said, I don't have time. And he said, well, look, are you traveling anywhere? And she said, well, I'm going to Europe next month. Good. He said, I'll buy both your ticket and my ticket and we'll fly together and I can talk to you. And she said, I want you to take that money and put it into the work and come here and volunteer to wash the homeless. And I don't know if he availed himself of it, but he sure learned the lesson. Uh, when I was growing up in uh, San Francisco, Bay Area, she got into a tussle with the San Francisco Fire Department. She had bought a building, an old building in a very bad neighborhood, and she was going to take care of the homeless there. And the city fathers didn't like that too much. And the, the fire department wanted a new fire station, so they used eminent domain to take away from Mother Teresa her building, well, guess who won that round? <laughs> and the fire department chief said, I won't quote him, he said something that in today's uh, political correctness I couldn't say, but he said, that is one tough, and he, he wasn't joking, but she, but she didn't do anything abusive, she was coming from her heart, she was coming from service. What is love? Love is about service, is it not? Highest good for all concerned. There was no self-serving in Mother Teresa. She wasn't trying to get an agenda. She had a service there. And if, if you are in this heart space of love, what you want to do is serve the highest and best in that other person, even if it doesn't suit you, especially if it doesn't suit you. Wayne Dyer's rather extreme and astringent definition of love was love is the ability and willingness to allow others to be and do what they choose to be and do with no expectation that they'll satisfy you. And that's, that's a splash of cold water on our downstairs love idea of love. But downstairs love is true too. There are times to nurture and, and support and, and do things with warmth. But there's also that need of the soul to empower others, to set boundaries with others, and to be with ourselves in the same way. So love is a force. It's a creative force. It is the power of creation itself. It is the creative force flowing through you right here, right now. You can feel it. It's palpable. It's flowing through your heart in this moment if you will just allow. You have to give in to it. You have to yield to it. I surrender to love, together. I surrender to love. Love already knows how to love, together. Love already knows how to love. And if you trust that divine intelligence, that will, that will help. That will help in very powerful ways, very practical ways, like Mother Teresa. Another thing that happens in love is that it lifts you to another level. It's very difficult for my personality self, my ego, to love your personality self, your ego. In fact, I dare say it's impossible. Well, then what's doing the loving? My soul loving your soul. 
Powerful, powerful thing. And so if you're having a hard time in personal relationships, perhaps you're taking it personally. That's what was going on with me when I had that heart experience that led to my going into ministry 20 years earlier. Very practical result, but what happened was that I needed to get in touch with this, this right here at the center of my being. And one of the ways to do it is to lift up into your higher self and talk to the other person's higher self. Now, at the end of my talk today, what I'm going to do is uh, lead you in a meditation that I use a number of times in my life that uh, gets you out of, at least psychologically speaking, out of your lower ego self and moves you into your higher soul nature, the Christ in you, so that you can address that higher nature of the other person. I did have one situation, though, where I went into my higher self and I was talking to the higher self of this other person. And um, that was the one where I think I shared it a few weeks ago where I asked, why is this person with this big ego in my life? And I got, so you'll get rid of your big ego. <laughs> Remember that one? And, but in this case, I was dialoguing with this person's higher self and I said, you know, what is it you need from me? And he said, there's really nothing I need from you. He's not listening to me either. <laughs> I don't know, that was what came up, and I just, what I learned from that was not to expect and just to back off and mind my own business and stay out of the, stay out of the fray. Sometimes the best thing to do in a situation like that, especially if somebody's serving their lobbing balls across the net, is don't hit them back, then you don't have a tennis game, you know, and that's a powerful thing. But lifting up, one time I experienced this lifting up exercise. I was in a church, I was new, they had a men's group, they wanted me to do the men's group retreat. And I went to this, the planning meeting, and one of the leaders of the group apparently wasn't in agreement and stood up and gave an impassioned speech why I was not a suitable person to lead this retreat. And it was very personal. Well, I, was, uh, I didn't know what to do about that. So I went home. I did a lot of journaling. But one of the things I did was I went into my higher self, talked to his higher self, and I asked, what is it that you need from me? And what came to me was patience. Patience. Well, I needed it because in the next few weeks, for the next year and a half, every single fellowship hall, every single Sunday, he would walk up to me and I would think, oh boy, what's it going to be this time? And he would have more and more creative ways of telling me where to go. I could, I could not believe this. And I'd never interacted with this person, so I, I you know, hard not to take it personally, but I, I, I exercised patience the best I knew how until one day, been there about a year and a half, he handed me a sheaf of papers and uh, said, I want you to read this. There was no insult involved with this. I was thrilled. So I read the thing, and it was his reminiscence of when he was 10 years old in the Cub Scouts and his scoutmaster had molested him. And... I was very touched by it, and I realized he was trying to tell me something. You know, sometimes we are transmuters in people's lives. What does that mean? This is deep stuff, so I'm taking a risk here. But transmuting means you take in the negative energy of another person, non-codependently, and it, you cleanse it, and you send it out as divine love and energy. And sometimes that may be what's going on in your family reunion. You're the transmuter, or in your neighborhood, or at your workstation. But in this situation, I, I, I took his sheaths of papers back to church and I was there waiting for him in fellowship hall and I handed him them and he said did you read it and I said yes he said my scoutmaster looked exactly like you <laughs> and so it not only explained a lot of things so what I did and I didn't share this at 9 30 I shared with him the seven step method of forgiveness he did the journaling he did the work and he and I became good friends we went to go out to lunch and he was a he was a great guy I got to tell another story. From this, it was the same church. This was many years ago. A woman walked up to me and she said, my first husband's name was Greg. He looked just like you and I still hate his guts. And I, <laughs> and I wondered why she'd been so, you know, kind of whatever. I, I, again, shared the techniques of forgiveness with her. She did the work. I ended up hiring her for a job. She did a fabulous job and we had a wonderful relationship. It doesn't always work out that way because it takes two to tango, it, they have to do the work too. But it is a powerful thing. At the very least, you may be in a position to transmute that energy. So, so lifting up into the higher self and leading with your heart. I lead with my heart and I'm open at the top. Together, 
I lead with my heart and I'm open at the top. Every day in our lives, we're given opportunities to come from our hearts. We think of these things as inconveniences. We think of them as annoying people or things that are getting in our way. But really, what we think is our life, which is I get to go over to Bud's Chicken and have some chicken and then I can walk along the beach and have a lovely time, that's not my life. My life is the spiritual growth of expanding my heart that happens each and every day when somebody cuts me off in traffic in a Buick or when somebody uh, says something or does something that I don't particularly like. And it isn't that you're supposed to be at, uh, victimized by or put yourself in harm's way or not have boundaries. Mother Teresa had boundaries. But it does mean that every one of these so-called inconvenient situations is there to expand your heart. And as you expand your heart, what happens? You grow your soul. You grow your soul. Jane Elizabeth Hart, my meditation teacher who wrote the Spiritual Power Tools book and the Seven Steps, she had an experience of this when she worked for IBM. She said that she had her workstation, she worked in inside sales, and her supervisor, very few people lasted long at all with this supervisor. And she'd worked there for many years. She would find mistakes, she'd get over, lean over you and find mistakes where there were no mistakes. And uh, it would always find something to criticize and to judge. And Jane said that she just would cringe every time this woman, her name was Janie, same similar name, would come up to her. And uh, so she went into her heart and she asked, she asked, uh, what should I do? And she just got, just love her. No matter what she does, be patient and love her. I mean, she's not hitting her. There's no physical damage. Just love her. So whatever Jane, I will try this better. I will do my best. She just loved her and loved her. She got to the point where she almost looked forward to Janie walking up to her. Not that you're supposed to like everything that goes on, but still. And she did this, and then the day came that Janie announced that she was retiring. And everybody in the office was thrilled. But they held a party, and they did gave her the presents, and they had the cake, and Jane went into the women's room, and behind her, maybe about 10 seconds after, came Janie, and Janie walked up to her and just fell into her arms sobbing and said to her, you are the only person I've ever felt love from in my life. Wow. What a privilege to express that. And what a gift. And what seed planting, what seed could be planted? And here's the thing. You plant seeds in people you don't know anything about. Jesus talked about scattering seeds in one field and then other people harvest it or you harvest in another field. I had a friend of mine who had a friend who was not real nice to her, but she was loving. She, was, she had boundaries. She wasn't a victim, but she went through it. And then two years later, she was in this wonderful friendship with this friend who was just like a you know, a soul friend, somebody, one of those really good friends. And then she was in deep meditation. It came to her, you sowed for this in that relationship. That relationship didn't work out to your liking, okay. But you put forth the energy and sowed in that field and you're reaping the harvest in this field. I guess they call that good karma. But that's where you put forth that energy, you put forth that cause, you put in a cause of good energy and something Something good happens later. And usually we don't connect the dots. Usually we think it's just happenstance. There is no happenstance in your universe. There are no accidents. These things happen because you may have done something. Even grace. We talk about grace and it is amazing and it's wonderful. But, but grace actually is matching funds from God, I call it. Meaning that you have done certain work where you you, you, you did spiritual service. You had a spirit of goodwill. You were coming from your heart. And then it's matched in a later situation with divine love. Uh, kind of like on the PBS where they say matching funds from this, but if you give 100 bucks, they'll put in 100 bucks. It's like that. I know. Does that make sense? But I really believe that it's true that you put forth that energy and then this comes forth. Now, I want to share with you this exercise that I've used many times of, and it's kind of advanced stuff. It, it may not appeal to you. The beauty of it, though, is that you still get a benefit regardless of whether you have any particular experience. Because when you move into your higher self and you're relating with another person's higher self, 
there's an energy exchange even if there's not an information exchange, even if you're not aware of it. So it still does the job. So I want you to just close your eyes and open your heart and allow yourself to remember that love knows how to love. Love already knows how to love. So you don't have to figure it out. Just get in touch once again with your heart. And as you do, you drop down into that heart space. You see in front of you, in your mind's eye, some elevator doors, and above it, it says, higher, to higher self, to higher self. Kind of like in an old department store, to higher self. And you walk up to the elevator doors and you push the button and you get on the elevator and the doors close behind you and you push the button that says higher self and you go up, up, up. And the higher you go, the lighter you feel, the more spacious you feel and the brighter you feel. And when the doors open, it opens into a beautiful, bright space. Whatever it is, it's beautiful, spacious, bright, lovely. And as you walk out of the elevator, someone is walking towards you, someone with whom you need to ask or share something heart to heart, higher self to higher self. This is the person's higher self, not their ego, so it's safe. And this is their all aware Christ nature, the I am of them. And as you greet them and you welcome them, ask them or share with them whatever you need to and then see what kind of response you get, how they answer. And now just thank them and whatever you feel you need to do for closure, whatever that feels right to you. And when you're ready, you just open your eyes. You allow yourself to move into this place, this moment. Feel yourself, the energy returning to your arms and legs and hands and feet and know that you received the divine guidance that you needed in order to experience what you needed to experience. Thank you, God. And so it is.